Good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeff Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is the Environmental Supervisor of the Orange County Sanitation District's Ocean Monitoring Program. He has been with the district for over 20 years. He actually told me it's 21 years, the whole time uh, in the Ocean Monitoring Group. He holds a bachelor's degree in marine biology and a master's degree in biology from California State University, Long Beach, go beach, and a PhD in biological oceanography from City University, Los Angeles. He is also adjunct faculty at Cal State Long Beach, working in the Environmental Endocr Endocrinology Laboratory, res re researching the effects of contaminants of emerging concern on local marine fish. I have known Jeff since 2003. Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> I was counting how long that is. That's not, okay. 2003. <laughs> we won't go uh, when I started working for him at, at Orange County Sanitation District while I was a graduate student at UCLA. Go Bruins. <laughs> uh, he, he played a, a big role, a big, huge role, in helping me get my internship and supporting my dissertation project, for which I am forever, forever, forever grateful. His scientific expertise and open-minded thinking is unparalleled, of which I'm sure you will see in tonight's talk. The title of tonight's talk is Sewers to Sand Dabs, Profiling Orange County Sanitation District's Ocean Monitoring Program. Please help me welcome Dr. Jeff Armstrong. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. I love that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it is truly my pleasure to be here. I've been to these talks and I'm so happy to be able to be here. The only thing I love more than talking is talking about what I do. And I do love to talk. You'll, you'll find that out. Um, I'm also of Irish descent. This is alcohol. Uh, <laughs> Aaron Gabra. Aaron Gabra, that's right. Uh, and also, uh, this is kind of, okay, I'm. I'm not allowed to play with anything sharp or electric, so I'm going to do my best with this. Uh, I am the ocean supervisor for the Orange County, Sa Orange County Sanitation District's Ocean Monitoring Program. Um, I'm going to borrow a line, actually a, a, a phrase that I heard from Dr. Alan Miller, who was my professor for field methods in ecology, when I, I remember we were at, uh, oh, what was it, Star Ranch, and you used the term larval ecologist. Well, when I was a larval marine biologist, this is what I dreamed of. White sand beaches and coral atolls, South Seas or Caribbean, maybe bikini clad assistants, you know, whatever. M male, yeah, preferably. Um, and I ended up working at a sewer treatment plant. How the hell does that happen, okay? Uh, the way it happened was I was doing my master's at Long Beach State and uh, uh, under Dr. Don Maurer and Dr. Don Reich. And I was, uh, those of you who have gone on to master's degrees and those of you who have not yet will find this out, you are pretty much at the beck and call of your, your advisor. And he ordered me to volunteer on a toxicity project at some place called the Orange County Sanitation District. I grew up in Orange County, I'm a Tustin native, and I had never heard of that. We live in a flesh and forget society. No one knows who we are, and that's why I'm here tonight. So at the end of the week, first thing I noticed was the smell, and, uh, and I, asked the guy that was, I asked the guy that I was working with, I said, how do you stand this smell? He said, what smell? <laughs> About uh, three months after I got hired, I took my daughter there on a weekend because I was you know, going to do something with a toxicity project, and she said, Dad, how can you stand this smell? And I said, what smell? I, now it's in... <laughs> Now it permeates my pores, it's in my blood. You know, it just is. Uh, anyway, and so they, at the end of the one week project, they said, you want a job? And I said, okay. And so I got a, an internship, and at the end of the internship, they said, you want a full-time job? And I said, okay. And I have now worked my way up through the ranks to environmental supervisor. There is nowhere else I would rather be. This is rubber meets the road science. Um, in my previous life, I was a police officer for the city of Santa Ana. I retired from there. I did this. I believe in public service. This is an extension of that from my previous career, and there's nowhere else I would rather be, not to mention the staff that I work with 
Uh, they do not work for me, they work with me, and they are the best people I've ever known. So um, I'm get on with that. Uh, this is who we are. We are the Orange County Sanitation District. Uh, we are the third largest wastewater treatment plant west of the Mississippi River. Only LA County and LA City treat more wastewater than we do west of the Mississippi. We serve about 2.7 million people. We treat 185 million gallons a day of sewage. We do it in Reclamation Plant 1 at I-405 uh, and, uh, and Euclid. Uh, you can probably smell it if you drive by there. Uh, treatment Plant 2 is at uh, PCH and Brookhurst, which is the, for you surfers, it's the river jetty area. And then we have our outfall, which I'm gonna talk extensively about in a little while. Uh, and that's where we discharge our treated wastewater. So how much is 185 million gallons a day? It can fill up Anaheim Stadium three times. That's how much we treat every day, 365 days a year. We're like Denny's, we never close. Their food is better. Okay, their food is better. I'll, I'll give them that. But I have actually had people, I'm, I'm a tour guide, I'm one of, the, one of the people that takes people around. And I've actually had people ask if we have a, uh, a gift shop. I go, what, what, what would you want to buy? I mean, come on, you know. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is I'm going to talk about who we are, what we do. I'm going to talk about the ocean monitoring program specifically. I'm also going to talk about some of the challenges we face, uh, our water reclamation projects. And I'm going to talk about a case study. And I'll get to that in the meantime. I'm just going to leave it at that for now. But I'm going to give you a little bit of wastewater 101. So first step in the process is source control. That's upstream. That's before we ever get there. We, we actually permit industries that discharge into our sewer, our sewer system. We have a, almost 600 industries that are permitted. Metal plating industries, you know, things like that. And that has been so effective in uh, especially metals that what can, comes into our system actually meets drinking water standards. Now that's not organics, that's not bacteria, but for metals it actually meets drinking water standards. This program has been so effective. It started in 1984 and by 1991 it was that effective. Once you get into the, the system itself, then you have the wastewater treatment plant. We have preliminary treatment, primary treatment, secondary treatment, uh, and biosolids processing and water reclamation. I'm not going to talk much about biosolids processing. I'm going to stick with the aquatic side because that's more germane to what we're talking about here. And I'm going to go into just a very brief uh, foray into the, the water treatment process. So preliminary treatment, uh, metering and diversion. We have the two plants. Everything that comes into our plant comes into treatment plant one at Euclid in the 405. And we have a diversion line that takes some of it down to the plant two in Huntington Beach. So the metering comes in when this is a biological process. The first part is chemical, but the second part, secondary treatment, is biological. If the water that's coming in doesn't meet pH, DO, or dissolved oxygen, I'll try and not do science speak, I'm sorry, uh, pH, dissolved oxygen uh, specifically, then we have to regulate for that and so we move it up, move it down, whatever we need to do to keep the critters happy because if the critters aren't happy the process fails. Uh, bar screens are just that. The water comes in, that's the first thing they hit. It's these huge bars and there's a rake that comes up and it takes the things that shouldn't be put down the sewer, down, down your toilet, down your drain. Things like condoms, uh, feminine hygiene articles, uh, plastics, you know, anything like that should not be put in the, in the uh, sewers. And so it, it takes those out. And I don't have a picture of the grid chamber. You, uh, you'll see it there on the, where is that thing? Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, on the lower right there. Uh, grid chamber is just that. We, after it goes through the bar screens, grid is things like sand, uh, coffee grounds, eggshells that get in there and they can really mess up our system. So we slow the water down. It comes in at about two and a half miles an hour. We slow it down and we let all the heavy stuff just sink. And we scrape it off the bottom and all, that's, all that and the, uh, the bar screen uh, reject is taken out and it's put into a landfill. 
So what gets through those two processes is what goes into the first actual treatment of the water. The air scrubbers, we used to get several hundred complaints a month because of the odor, obviously, I mean, it's sewage. We capped everything. We have these air scrubbers. What we do is we have these, these filter media that we seed with a, uh, a chemical that leaches the methane, the hydrogen sulfide, and the, the foul-smelling you know, chemicals out of there. It takes them out of the air, so when we release the air, it's no longer that malodorous. We're down into the single digits per month of uh, complaints rather than the hundreds that we used to have. So that's a good success story. Primary treatment, it's advanced chemical primary. What we do is we take uh, the water and we put them in these structures here. They're about seven to eight million gallons each. They're conical shaped like an ice cream cone. And at the bottom, they have a flange. So we put in this uh, chemical called ferric chloride. It's an iron polymer. It's got a net positive charge. For those of you that know chemistry, positive and negative want to attract and, and coalesce. So we do that, we let it mix around a little bit and we get things positively charged. Then we add a negative anionic polymer and some more of the particles get the negatively charged, positive and, neg positive and negative come together. They coalesce, they get heavy, they sink to the bottom. We open that flange, we drain it off the bottom. That's advanced chemical primary. That takes two to three hours and it removes 75 to 85% of the solids. Wastewater treatment is not designed to remove chemicals. It's designed to remove solid material. Most of the chemicals that are in the water will adhere to the particles and they'll be removed with that and they go to solids processing. But those that don't make it through that stay in the, the water phase, the aqueous phase, and get discharged and make it through secondary treatment, that's why I exist. <coughs> Excuse me. The oils and greases float to the top. We scrape them off the top, we take them out, uh, we treat them separately. Um, we have a, a fog, fats, oil, oils and greases process that we deal with. Fog is the number one cause of sewage blocks and, and backups and spills into, into the environment. So we treat that very seriously. We also have a big public outreach on that. Secondary treatment, we do two ways. One way is waste activated sludge. That's, that's our mainstay. We can do more water that way than we can with the, the trickling filters. Waste activated sludge is either aerobic or anaerobic, with air, without air. So what we do is we put them into these huge vats again, and we seed it with a bacterium, either aerobic or anaerobic, and we either take all the oxygen out or we put oxygen in. The critters get happy, they start feeding on this stuff, it's food for them, all of the, the biosolids, which, by the way, we are not the, I'll use the term, we are not the crap factories, you are. We're the refinery, we take your product and make it even better. So, <laughs> so the waste activated sludge, the critters get happy eating all this stuff, and then they get heavy, they sink to the bottom, we hit the mic, we scrape it off, and, we, and again, it goes to the solids processing. And that removes another 10 to 15%. We are currently getting 97 to 98% removal of solids uh, in our process. The other way we do it is trickling filters. This is what nature does. If you're out and you're wandering around and you want to drink from a stream, you want to drink from the bottom of what's called a riffle where the water is flowing over the rocks and the vegetation and all that because it has what's called a, a zooglial slime on it. That's bacteria, viruses, fly larvae, uh, worms, you name it, snails, it's got it. And it eats the stuff out of it and so it's cleaner at the bottom. What we have done is we take this and put it into, again, these huge, about three story, you know, uh, I think they're 150 feet across, uh, round cylinders. And you've probably seen them if you've flown into LAX or John Wayne or whatever, and you'll see these huge things with arms that float around like this with water coming out of them. Those are trickling filters. We just replicate what nature does. And we, we seed a filter medium, which is sort of a, about an eight to 10 inch square honeycomb 
that uh, a plastic one, and we seed it with a zooglial slime, and we just let the water do the same thing. Again, we get the same 75 or uh, 10 to 15 percent additional solids removal, but it's very, uh, it's not energy intensive. In fact, it uses almost no energy at all. And, uh, but the problem is it doesn't do it very, it doesn't do large volumes. And so our mainstay is waste activated sludge. We do as much as we can with trickling filters. The other thing I don't have on here that I just want to mention is uh, we have, we create our own energy. I mentioned the, uh, the air. Well, the gases come off, and especially out of the solids processing, methane and hydrogen sulfide, but methane in particular, we take and we process it, we turn it into a, a burnable fuel, and we have, let's see, four generators at plant one and five at plant two that we burn that gas and we create steam, it heats, the tur it heats it up, the turbines turn. We create enough energy every day to uh, power the city of Brea. And we use that in our plant. We use the steam as heating for our heating system in our buildings, our water heaters, everything. And what we do in excess, we sell to the grid to Edison. We are in the lower 50% of the nation in what we charge the citizens that we serve, and the way we've done it is being able to do things like this. And uh, so we're, we're very proud of, of that uh, process. Uh, there's been a 95%, this is SQURP, uh, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project in Costa Mesa. These are SQURP statistics. Since 1972, there's been a 95% reduction in sewage pollution, largely due to source control, Secondary treatment, which was, it's mandated under the clean, Federal Clean Water Act, but prior to 1982, it wasn't mandated at all, and primary treatment alone was the standard. So with that and improved treatment technologies, it's really cleaned up a lot of, of what's going into the ocean out there. This is an example. This is influent. This is raw sewage. This is primary effluent, and that's secondary effluent. And to get from here to here takes about six hours. And we're the best kept secret around. No one knows we exist. If you want to cripple a society, get rid of wastewater treatment and water treatment. It'll cripple a society. This is what your tax dollars go to and you're getting your money's worth, trust me. So where we do it, uh, like I said, we have uh, plant one, plant two, our, our outfall, I want to also say, uh, when there are representatives from uh, other POTWs, POTWs publicly owned treatment works, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, City of LA is represented here. Uh, I want to say that what I'm saying today isn't just Orange County. This is City of LA, County of LA, City of San Diego. We're the four largest in Southern California, but there are smaller ones. They're up and down the coast. There are over 16,000 wastewater treatment plants in the United States. We all do things basically the same way. Some go adi an additional level to tertiary treatment. Those are generally smaller ones and inland dischargers. We don't, but we don't have the capacity for that. But we're, I'm not talking, this isn't just me. This, I'm representing at this point the entire wastewater treatment community. Oh, one more thing. Uh, our outfall, we are called an end of the pipe discharger. discharger. We don't just send this brown stain out the end, end of a pipe that's four and a half miles long out into the ocean. There at the last mile of the pipe, there are 503 in our agency ports. that are about grapefruit sized and the water gently diffuses out through those 503 ports. The, the regulators say that we have a 180 to one dilution, which means we have a, we have a zone of initial dilution, which is 200 feet. It's 200 feet depth from top to bottom and 200 feet from the pipe. We cannot have an impact out of that 200 foot radius. We can't. And if we do, we have to answer for it. So uh, at the end of that zone of initial dilution, the initial mixing zone, whatever you want to call it, the 200 foot line, it's about 180 parts seawater to one part wastewater. UCLA has done studies, US EPA has done studies, others that say it's probably closer to 300 or 400 to one, 
but 180 to 1 is the standard that we're held to. So it's not a, a big brown slug that comes out. It's very gently diffused. We can actually measure it. Our, our, our capabilities with our instrumentation, they're so sensitive that we can measure it, you know, six, seven miles up coast if we follow the signal that far. But to just go out there and find it, you can't. It's very, very minuscule. Like I said, we don't, relieve, or we don't remove chemical contaminants. We remove solids with chemicals attached to them. I was doing a, a talk down in San Diego last October to a, an industrial group. And the morning of my talk, I came across this. And I found it just fascinating. The Chemical Abstract Society is yeah, based out of England. It's worldwide. If a company wants to put a chemical into use, they send the abstract to CAS. They, last year, in their 50th year of existence, accepted their 100 millionth abstract. There are 100 million chemicals registered for use worldwide. 75 million were added in the last 15 years. That's an average of 14,000 per day. 66 are currently commercially available in the United States. And many have little to no toxicological information known to them. And breakdown products for them are even less known. DDT is a good example. Everyone knows DDT. DDT has eight breakdown products, three of which are more toxic than the parent compound. And most of these compounds, they don't even know what the toxicity is of the parent compound, much less the, the daughter compounds. So, even if things are, are going well in the plant, everything's operating, it can still be going bad in the environment. That's why we're out there. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk specifically about our ocean monitoring program. I just talked to you basically why we're there. And it's really to monitor for effects. We are effects-based. We have three uh, different facets of our program. It's core monitoring, which is our mainstay. That's, that's what we do to show that we're not having an impact in the environment or that we are. Strategic process studies, these are things that, and I'm going to talk more about these in, in detail later, but these are things that come up, questions, unanswered questions, so we, we don't like to use the word research in our agency, so we call them strategic process studies. Regional monitoring, we're just one part of a much bigger ecosystem. The entire Southern California bite from Point Conception down to Cabo Colnet in Mexico, down past the U.S.-Mexico border. The Southern California Bight is one region, and we're part of that. So we do a collaborative research project, and again, I'll talk about more about that later. The core monitoring is compliance monitoring. We are regulated by the, fed, the feds in the state, US EPA and the state and regional water boards. Uh, we are issued a discharge to permit, which has to be renewed every five years. We're currently in the process of renewing our permit. It expires in July of next year. So we're already in the process of renewing that. It's uh, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, NPDES. Try to say that three times faster after you've had a little more of this. <laughs> I've tried both, I can't do it. Uh, the State and Regional Water Quality Boards, California Ocean Plan sets a lot of our standards, and then the Santa Ana Basin Plan. We are, in Orange County, we're in the Santa Ana region. The regional board is in Riverside, but it's based on watersheds. So our watershed is the Santa Ana region, and that's what we go. LA County has their own, San Diego has their own, but that's the one I'm gonna, uh, that we are under. What do we have to demonstrate in our program? We have to demonstrate that it's safe to swim at the beach, that the ecosystem is healthy, and that the fish are safe to eat, and that they are healthy. That's the mainstay of our program. This is one of my offices. Uh, this is uh, merchant vessel Nerissa. Uh, she's not a research vessel simply because we haven't filed the paperwork with, uh, with the state, but uh, she's 60 feet long. We've had her since 2004. She's uh, got an articulated A-frame on the back. Uh, we've got a uh, crane right here, deck crane, a wet lab. That's actually the, the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> we call it a head. Uh, but behind this uh, bulkhead or wall here is the wet lab. We have wet lab facilities. 
Uh, once in a while, we will have to do overnight or extended sampling. We, we can sleep about eight in there if we need to. Uh, we've got uh, galley or kitchen facilities here, uh, and of course the, uh, the wheelhouse. We have a full-time captain, and we have an almost full-time first mate, who is also a licensed captain. Our captain and our first mate are licensed with the Coast Guard. They have a 100-ton license, and, uh, and they keep everything up and running. Uh, people who come on board are amazed that she is as old as she is because they think she looks brand new. The crew keeps her very, very well maintained and keeps us in the water and sampling. We're out there, depending on the year, if it's a, a regional monitoring year, it's a little more, others are less, but anywhere from 80 to 120 days a year, she's out there doing something. So what are our core o OMP elements? Ocean monitoring program. We have water quality and physical oceanography sediment geochemistry, fish and invertebrate community analyses, fish health, and we look at, at part of that is fish tissue contaminants, we do liver histopathologies, and we look at parasites. Now, parasites. I thought I knew something about parasites until Dr. Coleman came to work, or then Julie Coleman, came to work for us, and she was Coleman then, not Passarelli. And then I realized I didn't know anything about parasites she was doing her PhD in that. And at one point, we were collecting uh, what is commonly called by fishermen out here, they call them sculpin, but they're, they're really uh, uh, California scorpion fish. And we were in the lab, and she pulled one out, and she said, find all the parasites. And I found about a half a dozen, and then she found 30 or 40 more. <laughs> we find the big stuff, you know. It, it, she finds the, everything else. But it has a place in our program, and we, we largely see one in particular, which is my parasite on, on Pacific sand dabs. And those are easy. I can find those. Even I can find those. So uh, we, we include that, but it's not just parasites. It's also things like ambicoloration, fin rot, uh, anything that might show that these fish are stressed. And we do it at our outfall. We do it at a, a sites farther away. We do it at sites in between to see if we can find them, and if so, is there a gradient leading away from our outfall that indicates the outfall is the problem? Good news is, no. Spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, so our offshore water quality program, we have a, a 28 station grid. Uh, we send this thing down here. Uh, this part of it here is called a CTD. It's conductivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, light transmissivity, photosynthetically active radiation. Color dissolved organic matter, blah, 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 blah. Uh, ammonia, we, what we do is we send this down to within about a meter of the bottom. It collects a reading about every tenth of a second down and up. And on the way down, it's continuous. And then on the way up, we stop at prescribed depths, which are basically uh, from the bottom and then every 10 meters going up all the way to the surface. And we do everything in meters. That's the way we science geeks are. Uh, and then uh, we fire off bottles at those prescribed depths. These are uh, Niskin bottles. And one of the things we take is ammonia samples. That's a good plume tracker for us. Wastewater effluent is full of ammonia, obvious, kind of obvious. And so that's a good plume tracker. That's one of the things we use. We also use uh, light transmissivity because the, the effluent has a different uh, light transmittance than the seawater and so we it diffuses out very readily but it's still you know we look for impacts to see if we're keeping the uh, photosynthetic light from reaching the plankton and the and the algae that's in the ocean so we look at that and those are our plume trackers and there we can see where the plumes going and uh, this was more I would say more important but it was uh, it, it was actually more important before we had things like uh, acoustic Doppler current profilers that we could set on the bottom, which I'm gonna show in a minute, and actually measure the current's speed and direction. This is sort of a, a, a secondary now. I think the, the ADCPs actually do the better job. We do shoreline bacteria. We do 18 core stations, and this is our, our sampling grid here. And, uh, but we also do 20 regional stations. The County of Orange, after the budget crunch of the 2000s, didn't have money to do shoreline bacteria sampling. We're not held to it. We've shown many, many times, and independent studies have shown many, many times, that our discharge does not impact the shoreline. But because the county proper didn't have the, re the, the resources to 
take those samples and process them to determine whether the beaches were safe to swim at, we do it voluntarily. And we have a, uh, a full-time uh, uh, bacteriology staff of about five, and we do offshore bacteria, we do onshore bacteria, and we take that data and we give it to the Orange County Healthcare Agency, and they decide what to do with the beaches, keep them open, post them, or whatever. So uh, that's what we do. Uh, I would like to call out uh, Laura Tadikas, who is sitting down in the obvious she, or, uh, audience. She is the head of that program. That's Laura right there. And, uh, and th her group does a fantastic job of this. Physical oceanography, which is also Laura's thing. Uh, she's sort of in uh, transition. Our senior scientist is sort of doing uh, uh, a transition for the time when he leaves and training Laura. Uh, and you can see the lovely Laura right there. Uh, so we have, uh, we have a physical oceanography program. We do things with moorings here. That's actually a mooring that never really worked very well, and I think we finally took sledgehammers to it. Uh, we now have two new ones, or we have one new one out there and a new one coming in. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but we do have moorings out there. We also have uh, thermistor strings and all kinds of, of instrumentation out there that's measuring uh, current speed and direction and temperature and uh, things like uh, uh, atmospheric uh, weather you know, readings, telemeter back to the, uh, to the shore in some cases. Some cases we have to go out and we download the data. Uh, so it's, very, it's a very active program. Laura's very busy. There she is again. Uh, we have ADCPs. These are acoustic Doppler current profilers. We put them on the bottom. They're upward looking. And what we do, we also have one mounted on our vessel. Uh, but these are upward looking, and what they do is they measure the current speed and direction all the way through the water column from the bottom all the way to the top. And what was really interesting is we found that at the bottom, the current goes one way, generally up coast towards, like from Huntington Beach towards Long Beach. But on the surface, it goes down coast, the opposite direction, and it's almost a perfect semicircle going up. We never knew that before we had these. It's been very interesting and it explains some of our patterns that we see in things like sediment chemistry and others, though now we, we have a much better handle on what's going on. Uh, so we do have the, uh, we also have gliders. These are more of a special project. We use them, we had to shut down our long outfall. We also have, that one goes four and a half miles out. We also have a one mile outfall. We haven't used that one since 1971. That was when we were discharging primary treatment only sewage. Uh, we haven't used that except for October of 2012 when we had to shut down the long one for repairs. So for 22 days, we discharged out of the short outfall. It took, what, about 18 months to get the permits and everything to do that, I, I want to say, and the engineering behind it and everything else. And we employed two of these. One we got from USC and one, this is actually Squirps. Uh, and we had them, what they do is they're like torpedoes and they fly through the water, or swim I guess is more appropriate. They swim through the water at prescribed courses and they'll go up and down and turn and, and whatnot. And they do the same thing pretty much that the, 80s, or that the CTD does. They take dissolved oxygen, pH, light transmissivity and all these things. And so we took that data along with our shipboard data, along with our ADCP data, and we were able to really tell where that discharge was going since it was now only one mile offshore instead of four and a half miles offshore. And so we really, it was really a great project. It was the subject of a uh, journal, art, or a journal uh, edition. Uh, it was like, I think, eight or ten articles total that were, uh, were published in that article, uh, Coastal Research, Journal of Coastal Research. And uh, so that's one tool in the toolbox that we use. We don't own it, but we have access to it. Uh, the currents, I talked about the acoustic Doppler current profilers. And I want to talk about creativity a little bit. You see the, what Laura is putting on, the heads of the ADCP. Anything that goes in the ocean is prone to fouling. Critters are, they attach to everything they can. You know, that's home, you know, oh man, it's a place to, to you know, put down roots. We were having problems with these critters fouling our, our equipment. So we called around, we looked at things. I mean, we looked at spending all, thousands of dollars and all kinds of stuff. And then one of our guys called up to someone he knew at NOAA in Seattle and said, what do you recommend? And he said, cayenne pepper and Vaseline. 
We have not had a problem since. And save the public lots of money. Another element of our program is benthic sampling, and that we do sediment geochemistry, and we also do uh, what we call in faunal invertebrates community analysis. These are the little critters that live in the sediments, not the crabs and the, and the sea cucumbers and stuff on the top that you're going to see in the exhibits. These are the little things. These are, some of them are a quarter of an inch or less. And we go down, we send this uh, pair of jaws down called a Van Veen grab, and it bites into the sediment. We bring it up. One half of those, we do a paired. There's two of them here. One goes for chemistry, one goes for in fauna. The in faunal and in funnel analysis uh, side gets washed through on this table, it gets washed down through a one millimeter screen and everything that's retained on that one millimeter screen gets taken, it gets fixed and then gets taken back to the laboratory where people spend months going through the myriad samples that they have to go through. Uh, one sample, well I think the most I know of had 2,500 plus animals in it and every one of them has to be identified to species whenever possible or the lowest possible taxon that we can get to. Um, and probably the minimal I've ever seen is 120 to 150. And so I've got a, a staff of well, about five or six people that pretty much do it about 70% of their time. Uh, that's what they're doing, sitting in front of dissecting scopes and compound scopes, some of which I'd like to call out Dr. Danny Tang sitting there. Uh, Dr. Tang is especially adept at the crustacea and uh, when we were, we were in grad school together at Long Beach and uh, when we took benthic invertebrate uh, to, uh, analysis, the lab was just that and the professor told me later, who later became my major, my advisor, my major professor, uh, said that Danny was the most talented, gifted taxonomist he'd ever seen and uh, now he works for me. Yay. Yay me. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is our grid of stations. The black ones we do once a year, and the white ones we do what twice a year. We do the black ones in the summer, we do the white ones in the summer and winter. It's a total of 68 stations, uh, as you see it here. So when you add this twice, it comes out to 98 stations a year or so. Uh, we're in the process of kind of redoing that, but uh, you know, this is where we're going to see things if we're going to see it. So you can see everything's clustered around there. And this is sort of getting at the larger uh, picture of the region that we may have an impact in. This is the Newport Submarine Canyon. That's the Newport Pier. This is the San Gabriel Submarine Canyon right there. And so you can see the extent of the area that we monitor. We do trawl sampling for fish and the large invertebrates that you will see in the uh, uh, exhibits here. What we do is we take an otter trawl net, which I have no idea why it's called that because I've been in this program 21 years, we have yet to catch an otter. <laughs> we've seen them though, we have seen them out there recently, which is kind of nice. We, we've seen them on several occasions now and they're not being transported down here, which means they're actually extending their natural range back to where they should be. That's very exciting. <coughs> Excuse me. So we uh, drag the net on the bottom, we bring it up, we put it into the contents into a live well here that's freshly pumped seawater from the surface. We uh, mix or uh, take dip nets and we separate them into buckets uh, based on their names, John, Tom, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and then we individually weigh and measure the first 15 of every species, individuals of every species that we collect. And then after that, we do a, a size classing and a batch weighing. But uh, we found that doing the, doing the individual weights was uh, appropriate at the time. We're kind of starting to go away from that because it may not have as much meaning as it used to for us. But it's still a, a good solid effort. But we uh, enumerate everything that comes on board, whether it's a fish, whether it's an invertebrate. Uh, if we can't identify in the field, we bring it back and we identify it in the lab and some things you have to. Uh, whatever we can put over live back into the ocean, we do. Uh, several of us, uh, we get sand dabs, Pacific sand dabs in particular, 
one haul, we may get two or 300 of them. They don't do well in buckets. And we figure our version of hell will be, we are put into a bucket when we die, and then we're gonna be strung up and weighed and measured. So uh, I, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, so we do that twice a year. This is the, uh, the sampling array we use. The black ones we do twice a year and in summer and winter. And then the white ones are just in the summer alone. Uh, these stations here are along the, uh, they're at, at about 35 meters. Uh, these are 60 meters, uh, 200 feet. That's our outfall depth. And then these go down to uh, close to 300 feet. Uh, this one in particular goes down even further. Um, to make sure that, because one thing we know is when the water is released from here, we know that it generally travels in an arc like this. So we want to capture these in particular here to make sure that the fish we catch are still healthy, they're not showing signs of tumors, lesions, fin rot, things, things like that. Again, the, the good news is uh, bite wide, we know this from the, the regional monitoring surveys, that about 1% or less of the fish show these kind of, of anomalies. And we are right along there. It's generally about 0.8, 0.9% of our fish have anything. And it's usually that one parasite in the eye of the Pacific sand dab. And that's, that, that's from point conception all the way down. So we are confident that we're not having those kind of, of gross uh, insults to the uh, fish out there. We do rig fishing. This is one of the better parts of the job. I get to go hook and line fishing, the whole staff does. Uh, we do two uh, regions. One is right at the outfall, and then one we're doing up coast here. We do it to replicate what the sport fishermen do. And we target rockfish in particular, the things that they're gonna catch, that they're gonna eat. We uh, catalog everything, of course. We look for the gross pathologies, but we also bring back uh, 10 of several species from each site. We take them back in and we do tissue analysis to make sure that the edible tissues are not in violation of state or federal standards for human health consumption. So we're looking at the environment, but we're also looking at human health. We have yet to have a violation and even close to a violation, so that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, you can see you know, some of the work there. This is a scientific survey. We do, we calculate catch per unit effort. Uh, again, we're cataloging everything, weighing and measuring, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that comes on board. And since we are targeting rockfish, and rockfish are, um, you know, they're, they're being overfished, there's a real issue with that. So in our effort to uh, put back everything alive that we can, we use this to, uh, these guys are being caught at two, 300 feet. When they come up, the pressure and the temperature are real issues for them. So we, we put them alive back in this. It's, all, it's nothing more than a milk crate with a top that has a release on it. We send it all the way back down to the bottom so they're now at their native temperature, their native uh, pressure, and then we release that and let them go out of there. Uh, the research has shown that overall this is a very good process and has a high recovery rate and, uh, and the fish do survive quite a bit. So we don't, I don't know personally how our process does, but I haven't had any fish come back and complain, so I can only assume it's okay. <laughs> Toxicology is another part of our program. That's actually what I did when I first came in. Uh, the way I got into it, because marine ecology was my background, my education, uh, my master's program worked uh, some into the toxicology aspect, but when I hired in full time, uh, it was about a year later, our toxicologist retired, and they lined us all up, and I was the only one that could spell environmental toxicology without writing it down. So I became the environmental toxicologist at the time. So we do uh, whole effluent toxicity. Our effluent that goes out, we test it every month for chronic toxicity, and then once a quarter for acute toxicity. Chronic. 10-day exposure to the animals, uh, see how they survive, reproduce, whatever they may. We're using real small little critters, little shrimp-like guys. Uh, or then the, the acute is more what we call kill them and count them. It's a, four short, uh, a short four-day exposure, what survives at the end of the four days. This is, we are held to a regulatory standard on this. It's very precise, it's very uh, controversial. And we have no problem passing it. Uh, but it, it does have its issues involved. It's a good tool in the toolbox, I think, as a screening tool 
not necessarily as a drop dead, you have to meet this, this number. Because animals are animals, and no, anim no two animals respond the same to anything, just like no two people do. We're animals. So, you know, it, I, I think it's more of a good screening tool. We also do whole sediment toxicity, where we get sediments. The same time that we go out and collect for sediment chemistry, we bring it in and we uh, put an amphipod, which is a little shrimp-like guy down, and we put 10 of them in a, in a beaker at a time. I'll show you right now. That's what it looks like. Uh, these are the beakers, and we put them in there, and we let them sit for 10 days, and we see how many are alive at the end. We, there's also a, a, a more fine uh, measurement where we look at how many are go up to the surface rather than stay in the sediment. Uh, and so all of these are factored in, and we're, we're now, we're not held to a standard on that. It's a data gathering exercise by US EPA. And so we just have to report the data. Uh, again, we have very low to, to no sediment toxicity out there measurable. We have some challenges though. One is delineate, delineating our alpha impacts from every, the myriad other things that go on in the world. Aerial deposition of contaminants. Airplanes fly over, things get in the air, they, the winds take them out, they drop into the ocean. Runoff from rivers, harbors, and storm drains. I didn't realize how much of an issue that was until we had a, a bacterial problem on Huntington Beach in 1999. Some of you may remember when the beach was shut down from July 3rd, 1999 until the day after Labor Day and they estimate that $3 billion was lost in, in uh, revenue in the city of Huntington Beach alone. And when we started looking at dry weather runoff, we found that when there's no rain and hasn't been for weeks, that there are approximately 14 million gallons a day of water that flows through the storm drains and into the ocean. And that's from people overwatering their lawns, washing their cars, all that stuff washing down. I have a neighbor that even today washes down his damn driveway. What does he think is going to grow into a freeway or something? I have no idea. Uh, <clears throat> so things like that add up. You know, there are 2.7 million people just in our service area. There's 3.5 million in Orange County, 19 million in Southern California. All these things add up. So dry weather flows are, are huge, literally. Uh, natural environmental variability. You know, we may see something out in the ocean, but what is, what is the natural environmental variability? We are held to a standard from our control station, which is supposed to be a reference, you know, non-impacted station, to the outfall that we cannot deviate 0.2 pH units, but the natural variability is about 0.5. So we have to justify all that. Uh, climate change and ocean acidification are just things that we're just starting to really get a, a, a look at. I won't say a handle on because that's decades away, but we are starting to look at that actively, both our agency and regionally uh, cooperative programs with City of LA, County of LA, San Diego, Squirp, uh, 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 universities are becoming involved. It's a, it's a huge undertaking, but it's something that we really need to get a handle on. And that gets us to regional monitoring. That's our core monitoring program. That's, that's our mainstay, and I, I'm, just I'm just scratching the surface, honestly. I, I could go on. Core monitoring could be a three-hour lecture, if not more, all on its own. Regional monitoring started in 1994. The Southern California Coastal Water Research Project looked at it and said there's about $35 million a year spent in monitoring between the wastewater treatment plants, universities, everybody else but no one does things the same way. We can't compare our data to city of LA to city of San Diego. So they coordinated everything, which is like herding cats. And I th actually think cats are easier um, because everyone wants to do their own thing. You know, we want to do it our way. No, we want to do it our way. We finally got it. So now we did it in 94, we then did it in 98. Now we do it every five years. So bite 18 is the next one. We did it in 13. It's, we standardized all the methods. We have about 300 plus sites that we do within about a two month period, July and August of the years that we do this, from Point Conception to the US-Mexico border. Uh, it's a huge undertaking, but it's also really interesting to see the results. It's very relevant. And it allows each agency to put their own data into context in the larger area. 
which is really valuable. I find that, that very valuable for our, our group. Some of the regional issues beyond that are harmful algal blooms. You know, we are putting nutrients out into the water. We put phosphorus, we put nitrogen. Uh, our, our solids, which I didn't even touch on, are some of the best, most nutrient-rich fertilizers you'll ever want to see. So what doesn't get taken out gets discharged into the ocean. Well, they're, that's, that's fertilizer for algae. So are we impacting harmful algal blooms? Climate change, again, you know, uh, what are the issues out there that, that we may either be impacting or that we have to know about and deal with? Ocean acidification is huge. We're about to start a pilot project through SQUIRP, the, the POTW, or the wastewater treatment agencies are doing this, where we're going to look at this in particular, we're gonna look at a thing called a pteropod, which is a little snail that has a, a rudimentary shell, uh, but it's, it's very small, it's a, it's a little plankton guy, but we're, they're finding specifically in the Pacific Northwest that the shells are not able to uh, properly form and it's impacting their ability to survive. They're part of the base of the food chain. And are we having that problem here? We don't know. So uh, later this month and then again next month, we're gonna start the pilot project on that. And depending on the, the results of the pilot project, it may turn into a long-term research project for all of Southern California. Water reclamation, that's huge. We live in a desert. This is the Upper Sonoran Desert. The only reason we have the water we have is because we steal it from Northern California, Colorado River, and Mexico. So water reclamation is huge. We are in a long-term drought. I know that the governor just said that he's easing water restrictions. Um, okay, <laughs> enough said. Uh, we, are, we consider ourselves now the first step in the water treatment process, not the wastewater treatment process, but the water treatment process, and this is why. In 2007, we initiated the, I take the back, 2008, we initiated the Groundwater Replenishment System, GWRS. It is the largest wastewater reclamation project in the world. It's in collaboration with the Orange County Water District. What we do is we take our secondary treated water, we send it, they're right next door to us, they're our neighbors right across the fence. Actually, we took the fence down. We send it to them, they do the next level of treatment. You know, I, I explained what primary and secondary was, they do tertiary. What they do is reverse osmosis, microfiltration, and they irradiate the water with UV light to kill any pathogens that remain in the water. That water is then taken and pumped up uh, about 15 miles or so up into the area of the Santa Ana River Lakes in the Anaheim area where it's put into percolation ponds and it's allowed to filter down into the aquifer naturally from there. Now nature is filtering it as well and eventually it's pumped out again as drinking water. We're doing 130 million gallons of wastewater a day we send over to Orange County Water District, which produces about 100 million gallons of drinking water. Now, if you do the math, that says there's 30 million gallons left. That's reject, that's all bad stuff. That's the RO reject, that is the microfiltration reject, and that has to go somewhere, and where does it go? It goes out of the ocean outfall. It's mixed with the remaining water and sent out there. The goal is 100% uh, recycling by 2022. There is currently legislation pending in Sacramento to mandate that of every wastewater treatment agency in the state of California. When we heard that, we had an issue because 100% recycling is not capable. You know, we can't do that, it's not feasible. There's that 30 million gallons of reject. It's now been amended and it's in committee to read 100% of the water capable of being recycled. So now that allows for that 30 million, but that still means that 30 million in our case has to go somewhere. I figure I've got eight to nine years left in this business before I retire. The remaining eight to nine years of my career are working on that issue right there. Because if we're taking 100 million gallons of clean water out that we're currently discharging and not replacing it with anything, that means we're putting out pretty much just concentrated, potentially bad stuff. 
So how are we going to deal with that? That's the that's going to be what my group does probably for the remainder of their careers as well as we'll be dealing with this. It's a good effort. I think that we need to recycle as much as possible, but it's going to be a challenge, a very, very big challenge. Public perception was the first challenge we faced. The yuck factor, toilet to tap. I don't want to drink what someone else already drank. Fact is, we all drink what someone else already drank. There's only a certain amount of water in the world, and everything has been, every molecule of it has been drunk by something at some point. So get over it. It's, it's clean. The process, now that I work in the industry and I really know, the water, the water treatment process is amazing. Uh, I talked about what Orange County Water District does with our water. So one of the things they found when we first started this in 2008 was they started pumping water and they found that the pipes that they were pumping it in were starting to crumble. It's because the water was so clean that it was leaching the minerals out of the pipes. They're clay pipes. Natural water has calcium, magnesium salts, uh, a bunch of stuff. They were taking all of that out. It was ultra pure water and the pipes couldn't handle it. So they now have to put that stuff back in just to get it up to where it can go into the, into the, uh, the basin. So it's not a yuck. It really isn't. It's, it's good stuff. Regulatory requirements are another thing. Source waters. Uh, there are waters we are not allowed to use for reclamation because they come from uh, EPA Superfund sites because uh, you know there are, are legacy contaminants and things. Okay, a lot of that is just that it's legacy and a lot of that's been cleaned, but because it still has Stringfellow is one of the, the things that comes up, uh, if, if any of you are aware of that. Actually, we can treat that and we can take all that stuff out but because of regulations, we're not allowed to. If we can do that, then we can actually reclaim more water than, than we're doing today. Public outreach, again, that goes back to the yuck factor. We've done a lot of public outreach. We turned the, the switch on in January 2008 for the groundwater replenishment system. We began the public outreach in 2001. It took that long to get the public on board to where we could do that, and we have to. Everyone has to. It's just, it's the way of the future. As I understand, LA County is talking about doing it. If they're not already, others are, are on the way. And it, if we're gonna, if we are going to provide water for everybody that we have in Southern California, this is one of the ways that we have to do. So strategic process studies will be one of the ways that we look at the environmental impacts of this. These are answers to questions that aren't addressed in our core monitoring. Uh, we look, we have new regulations, emerging issues, and a lot of unknowns out there. Uh, right now, what we do is, uh, I mentioned our uh, fish bioaccumulation. You know, we, we collect fish from the alpha, we, we collect it from uh, other areas, and then we do tissue analysis. And we're looking for human health, but we're also looking to see, are there more contaminants in the fish at our alpha, you know, compared to uh, sites away. Okay, we assume that where we catch the fish is where they were exposed, but honestly, we don't know. We don't know where these fish have gone. We don't know where we don't know where they were a week before. And there are some fish that have been tagged that you find they're tagged in Alaska, and two months later they're caught off British Columbia. Um, who knows? So we are about to uh, do a fish tagging project with Dr. Chris Lowe. You probably have heard him recently or seen him on TV because of the shark attack. He's the leader of the shark lab at Cal State University Long Beach. And, uh, and so Chris is pulling his hair out at the moment. I talked to him on the phone uh, Thursday, and that's pretty much what he said. Uh, so anyway, we're doing a, a tagging project that's starting next month with Chris. And we're gonna put electronic tags on the fish that we capture for uh, both histopathology in the livers and for uh, tissue contaminants and see where they go over the course of a year. And then we'll have some indication of, did they really get exposed? at our outfall or you know did maybe they just showed up because you know they heard this is where all the cool kids are going I don't know um, uh, groundwater replenishment expansion that's going to be a huge one for us and nutrient discharge I mentioned that these are all things that are examples of strategic process studies uh, one example another example was emerging contaminants uh, this is something that I got involved with 
I hired on into the districts or into the district in uh, full, well, 1994, I, I got hired in. In 1998, I went to a conference up in San Francisco at the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, CTAC, and I noticed that a real big undercurrent of that was something called endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I brought it back to my agency and said, you know, I'm hearing all this and someday we're gonna get asked about it. And the only bad answer is, I don't know. If Heal the Bay, if Surfrider, if the National Resources Defense Council comes to us and says, what do you know about the fish in your area and endocrine disrupting chemicals? If we say we don't know, we're gonna look like idiots. So we started working with, at first it was the US Navy out of San Diego, and then we started working with uh, Dr. Dan Schlenk at UC Riverside, and that morphed later into working with Dr. Kevin Kelly at Cal State Long Beach. And why did the top one not come up? Um, okay, these are not well understood. I talked about the chemicals in the beginning. Uh, you know, the, the 66 million that are registered for use in the US currently, you know, we don't know a lot about them. So, uh, and a lot of these are prone to media exposure. And I was at a, a, a different meeting in October and there was, uh, someone used the term contaminants of emerging publicity, which I thought was really interesting. I kind of liked that. Um, but what was interesting about the contaminants of, of emerging concern, initially the endocrine disrupting chemicals, was in 2000, November 2001, I was at the SeaTac meeting in Baltimore and a, pub, or a paper that Dr. Dan Schlink and I published uh, went public and it was made public at that meeting. Dan did the, the thing. And this is one of these, they started calling them girly fish because we found that evidence of certain fish off the coast here were becoming male fish, were becoming feminized because of endocrine disruption. And it was our 15 minutes. We ended up on CNN and all these things. It was, it was, a, it was a fun ride while it lasted. And, but it, it showed that it really is an issue. It was, it's honestly less of an issue out here. It's an issue for all wastewater dischargers. Um, if anyone is on birth control and urinates into the toilet and flushes it, it's gonna be an issue in the, in the ocean because the chemicals largely make it through and out there. So inland dischargers have a much, uh, uh, much bigger problem with this than we do. We're well mixed out here and, and whatnot, but we do have evidence of exposure. Not really, even the male fish that we found were being feminized, were, they were still functionally males. They were still producing sperm. The populations were still viable. Everything was good. You looked at it over time and the populations were stable, but fish were expressing, male fish were expressing uh, particularly a female uh, eggshell protein, which all vertebrates, including myself and every male in the audience, is capable of expressing, but we don't, unless we're exposed to this. So this has been one focus of our strategic process studies is this. And uh, what was really interesting was in March of 2007, I was invited to represent the wastewater treatment community and give a congressional briefing on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. on this issue. And the, you know, honestly, it was the least stressful talk I've ever given in my life because I realized those people know nothing. <laughs> I started my talk, it was myself and two other people, one from US EPA and one from US Geological Survey. And I started my talk, my 20 minute segment with, you know, feel free to ask me anything at any time, you know, it's okay, I don't care, you know, just if you raise your hand. And I said, and if I don't know the answer, I'm gonna make one up. And they laughed, I said, I'm not kidding. And uh, you won't know the difference. And then they went, oh. <laughs> so, uh, but it's really been an interesting thing. Uh, uh, our agency, in collaboration with university researchers, we've now published 14 papers on this issue uh, since 2001 was when our first one came out. And, uh, and it, it is, continues to be a focus of our, uh, our program because it's going to continue to be an effort as long as people urinate into the toilet. Oh, there it is, how about that? What do you know? Okay, the future. We're undergoing a paradigm shift. Uh, I became the ocean supervisor, what, uh, this 2016, four years ago. I've had this idea in my head for a while that what we do, we do a lot of, 
And we've done it for, in our agency's case, four decades. Some of that's overkill, and some of it isn't even relevant anymore. Okay, it, in the late 70s, 80s, and maybe even into the 90s, when you know, the DDT issue was still fresh, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, okay, it, it required a lot of, of monitoring. Now we know it's out there, we know where it is, and it's gonna be out there for hundreds of years. And whether we do it four times a year, two times a year, or once every five years, we're gonna get the same answer in a long-term analysis. So why are we expending public funds and wasting public dollars, in my opinion, and my staff's time on measuring something four times a year when we can do it once every five years and get the same answer, when we have it, contaminants of emerging concern, we have water reclamation issues, we have a lot of things we really need to spend public money on, that ain't one of them. So we're in the process of renewing our ocean discharge permit and one of the things we are doing is just that. We're gonna free up agency resources to address things that really matter. Contaminants of emerging concern, water reclamation, are we even looking at the right endpoints when we're measuring things in fish and invertebrates? Maybe there's a better endpoint that's more sensitive that we really ought to be looking at. Uh, we need these, this meaningful information and not something just because we've always done it, which is a paradigm in monitoring, quite honestly. I posed this at a meeting in October that I went to and the man sitting in front of me turned around with shock on his face and shook my hand. He was the executive officer from one of the water, re water board regions in the state of California. He said he's been thinking that for a long time and he's actually tried to get it, but his permittees, the dischargers, didn't want to do that because they were comfortable with what they were doing. That's wrong. We need to address things that are meaningful and that's where we are heading in the future. And our preliminary conversations with our own regulators have been very positive. The, and we agree to this, that there will be no overall decrease in effort. The level of effort will remain the same or increase, but we're gonna put it into things that are meaningful. We have a responsibility to the public we serve to make it meaningful and to make sure that we are protecting the resources that everyone deserves. And so that's where we're heading in the future. Last thing I wanna talk about is a case study I mentioned. I get this question, it's great, you do all this monitoring, that's so cool. You ever find any problems? I don't get this question as often as I would like, quite honestly. Prior to 2008, my answer was really no. It wasn't that bad. We, we had minimal impacts and everything was okay. Since 2008, my answer is oh yeah, absolutely. I'm going to just touch on it because this again is a three hour or more lecture all on its own. In August 2002, we thought it'd be the right thing to disinfect our final effluent, or our effluent, I should say, our wastewater with high, high concentrated chlorine bleach. It was the only thing we could do. We were con it was right after the Huntington Beach uh, bacterial contamination incident, the beach closure. We were the obvious target because we discharged sewage, treated sewage. So, it was a knee-jerk reaction and we did it. It was the only method we could do with the facilities we had. The existing infrastructure wouldn't allow for things like UV irradiation and, and whatnot. Really, disinfection was the only choice we had. But we weren't built out for disinfection, which meant we had to retrofit our plant. So we were using, instead of trickling the bleach in and letting it sit for long periods of time like hours, you know, 10 hours or so, we were just putting massive amounts of bleach in for three to seven minutes and then hitting it with a dechlorination agent and trying to get as much of the, the free chlorine out and, and whatnot as possible before discharge. Okay, sounds good on paper. Purpose was pathog pathogen reduction. We never saw a change on the beach, never. The only thing that changed was when we started diverting that 14 million gallons a day of dry weather flow into our plant, which wasn't going before it was going onto the beach. Once we put it into our plant, then the bacteria counts dropped. But before that, when we started this, nothing changed. By that time, it was in our permit. We had to do it. 
It was a regulatory requirement, and that's just the way it was. Well, for the first couple of years, it wasn't any big deal. We didn't really see any changes. But what happens when you put this amount of chlorine, and, and, and especially high concentrated chlorine like that in, to a, um, a water that has a lot of organic material, it creates what's called disinfection byproducts. They're chlorinated compounds. Chlorinated compounds are pesticides. So chlorinated, it created chlorinated compounds that once you put the dechloragen in, didn't affect because by now these were formed and they were stable and now they were getting through our system and out into the ocean. What do chlorinated, com what do pesticides work on? They work on insects. What are crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, lobsters? They're that same thing. So my toxicology background, I fought against this and my toxicology background said that we were going to have problems. I consulted with other toxicologists. They said two to three years, you're going to see some issues. We started in August 2002. Our July sampling of the invertebrates in 2005, I saw a decline in the crustaceans and I saw a decline in the echinoderms, sea stars, uh, things like that. Things that are pollution sensitive. There are actually animals that are pollution tolerant. Some worms, polychaetes are. I did my master's on one. And uh, thing, a little guy called Capitella capitata, we call him Cap Cap. Uh, he's commonly known as one of the three little pigs. The three little pigs are three animals that are very tolerant to pollution and they colonize, they're opportunistic. And when other things die out, these guys come in in gangbusters. And Cap Cap was, was the big one. Uh, so we, we, uh, saw that just a slight change, and it was right at the outfall, right at the end of the outfall. And over time, yeah, I saw it a little bit, but it wasn't enough to say it was out of the range of natural variability until uh, January or July 2008. And then I saw a big crash. January 2008, we turned on the groundwater replenishment system, our water reclamation project. That cut the amount of water that was going out of the outfall into the ocean, but we got those reject streams in. They also, Orange County Water District, uses chlorine to clean the RO membranes. So we were adding chlorine, they were adding chlorine, and we were reducing the amount of water going in. Again, we, it, it, there was a, a large group of, uh, about three years of research that went into this, but uh, so we, we saw that, uh, we increased it to Oh, that was July, I'm sorry, July 2008. January 2009, we went to 90 million gallons a day, and it crashed even further. And still, no changes in bacterial counts on the beach. So it wasn't a bacterial issue at this point. We were killing stuff in the ocean. The kind of changes we saw began in, in 2005, 6. It was initially within the, the mixing zone. Uh, it increased with intensity over time, both at the end of the outfall and away from it. It started to radiate out. Okay, that is a danger signal to me. Now we are the source. And we didn't see any, any um, gross changes in the fish, except that as the crustaceans went away, the crustacean feeding fish went away, and as the polychaetes and worms and all those things came back, came in, then we saw those fish that eat those things come in. So I saw a shift in the community there. Again, very alarming and very noticeable. And ultimately, when we did a, a liver histopathology study, at that time, we didn't have to do one. It was out of our, our permit. Uh, but we did one anyway, and we found that there was a difference. We found more liver pathologies, tumors, lesions in fish at our outfall than we did at our reference site. So big red flags. This is an example of quick and dirty of, of what we saw. Uh, the take home here is blue is normal. Red is changed and green is degraded for the infonotrophic index. It's an index that we use. We calculate based on what critters are present and what numbers at, at each site. So you can see from 1985 to 2004, the normal at our outfall, this is my canary in the mine shaft, worst station possible, was still 40% normal, only 52% changed and only 8% degraded. 68% degraded after 2004. 100% normal at our reference site. Okay, that's nothing that's regional, that's not aerial deposition, that's our discharge. 
Benthic response index, which is another, it's kind of like the infonotrophic index, it's just scored differently and, and whatnot, but the same basic results. Um, per the, the BRI, we showed no normal, you know, no normality at all there, 100% normal at our reference. But even then, marginal deviation, which is truly, in this, ref in, in this index, a marginal deviation. I would not call it degradation or anything similar. But 70%, you know, 77% prior to 2005 and after 2005, loss of biodiversity and then, what is that, 8% is uh, loss of function. That's major change. We're talking major change. An example, I talked about Capitella Capitata. At worst, prior to this, our worst time, right at the outfall, worst station, we had maybe 100 Capitella in a sample. At one point, we had 2,500 in a sample, and it was 98% of the species composition. There were only 2% of the composition was anything else, and they were all worms or, or uh, uh, clams, and they were all pollution-tolerant species. It was bad. It was very, very bad. So this is our sampling array. These are the stations that were affected, and these are the stations that showed true degradation. Most of them were still within the, that zone of initial dilution. Now, oh, sorry. There we go. See, I told you I'm not allowed to play with anything electronic. This is not the same station array that we have now. We changed our station array based on this study and these results to better bracket the outfall and capture these quicker and better than we did at the time. The, the station ZB2, ZB, that means ZID boundary, zone of initial dilution boundary. That's the boundary that we can have an effect in but not outside. The closest station to the ZID boundary was half a mile away. Well, we were degrading, severely degrading at the boundary. And there were people that were saying, well, you, you know, it's not outside the ZID. If it's at the boundary, one foot outside, we're not allowed to have an effect. Just because we can't measure it a half a mile away doesn't mean it ain't happening. So we finally, I was able to convince people that we really needed to look at this, and, and the agency did. We used a two-phase approach. Phase one was basically looking at our historical data, and that was some of that data I just showed you, those, those pie graphs, of Again, we've been monitoring since 1971. It has to be worth something. This is where the money was well spent. We now had a before and after. And there's a, a type of analysis called a before after control impact. And it's basically showing what happened before, what happened after, here's your, your insult point, what's the difference? And that was the result, that's the pie graph I showed you. But that was an example of what we did. We did four studies to look at historical data analysis to identify potential causes. Then we did phase two, which was six focus studies to investigate those potential causes and identify what it was. You would think it would be a no-brainer, but we're talking about government. And government includes our regulators, and they wanted absolute proof, or at least beyond a reasonable doubt, that chlorination was the issue before they would let us stop chlorinating. So we spent this amount of time and a lot of money to do this kind of work, and we did all kinds of things. Again, I, I don't have the time to get into everything we did, but just suffice it to say that it was a, a large, large effort. And we found there were two likely causes. One was the use of hypochlorite, highly concentrated bleach for disinfection, and creating these, these uh, compounds that didn't degrade and built up in the sediments. They're prone to UV degradation, but at 200 feet down off the coast here, there's no light that reaches that. They're not enough to, to degrade these chemicals. So they just kept building up, and that's why it took three years to see an effect. And then the concentration of the final effluent because of the, the reclamation project. We measured it, we did oceanographic studies where we could actually measure the concentration of these disinfection byproducts in our, in our effluent discharge. The discharge isn't uniform throughout the day. We have peaks, we have valleys, high flow, low flow, and at high flow, it was different than it was at low flow. And at low flow, when more of the concentrate, it was a higher percentage of what we were putting out, it concentrated and it, it really was telling. 
So those were our two likely candidates. So it does have a happy ending. Uh, we went to full secondary treatment in March 2011. Prior to that, we, we weren't at, we were building the processes out to do that. And, uh, and then we, we were able to decrease our uh, chlorine use by 90%. Uh, the recovery was evident by January 2012. Already saw it happening. We finally convinced everybody with a huge public outreach. We went to city councils, to Surfrider, Heal the Bay, you name it. We talked to them and got everyone's buy-in. And I was uh, heartened by the fact that when we told our story, the first question we got across the board was, why don't you just stop? You know, we were expecting a big public outcry because of the Huntington Beach thing. No, it was stop killing stuff, man. So that was, that was huge. So uh, March, uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 2014, we ceased uh, chlorination completely and we've had a full recovery. In fact, now that we're a full secondary and we're not discharging toxic chemicals like we were, uh, we actually have uh, within our zone of initial dilution by those two metrics I showed before, the uh, benthic rep response index and the infonotrophic index, we're at reference standards now. The, I, the uh, the environment is just amazing at its ability to recover. I would like to, you know, thank one, thank you guys for, for being here. I want to call out one more member of my staff that I know is here, and that's Ben Ferraro. Um, ben is uh, new to the group, but he's already become an integral part. I have a great team that I work with. Um, technically, they're my staff, they're my colleagues. Uh, they're, they're wonderful. Many of them are Long Beach State grads. Um, I hire in, so I, I get to choose, um, so it's great. Um, but, you know, the successes in this program are due to the hard work and dedication of the professionals that, uh, that, that I work with. And the support of the agency that I have, the uh, wastewater treatment community is under rep underrepresented in, in the public. It's un very misunderstood. Um, if you really want to you know, see what it would be like, just stop flushing your toilet and, and uh, you won't like it. But, but thank you very much. And with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. Yes. About the 2002, uh, there was a report of uh, contaminants in the water and number one was hydrocodone and number two was estrogen. Mm -hmm. And do you know if that's still the same? Uh, it depends on what the discharger is. Uh, the guy, I mentioned Dan Schlink at UC Riverside that we did uh, some work with. Uh, Dan did a study where he looked at four, and this is in different parts of the country, we looked at four wastewater treatment plants and what was coming out of them. And three had low to moderate estrogenic activity. One was off the scale. It happened to be, uh, what is it, Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, college town. Lots of birth control going on there. <laughs> and so it really depends. Uh, it waxes and wanes uh, to some degree. Now there are uh, some areas where illicit drugs are a major part of the discharge. There are others where it's not. Um, today, is that true? I honestly don't know. And this is one of the things too. I, again, I could talk for hours literally on this. I would bore you people to death. But in, the, in our program, we monitor for 400 chemicals and that maxes us out. That's pretty much all we can do. 66 million chemicals are you know, in use or potentially in use in the US. So we're a drop in the bucket. We're starting to do projects. We had it in, our la in the current permit that we have, discharge permit, to do a study where we look at um, another 100 priority contaminants of emerging concern. Okay, so now we're at 500. Again, you know, there's 66 million more out there. So I don't know. Um, it depends on resources, and we, we do what we're really regulated to do, and we do some beyond that, but there's a realistic constraint of money and staffing. So uh, I would recommend that you, everybody, you know, don't just listen to what you hear on the news, do your own research, contact people, ask them. I don't have the answer, I'm not a chemist, and uh, I know that our chemists do things that we don't necessarily get reported in the Ocean Monitoring Program, 
Uh, but if you contact me, I'll get that answer for you, at least what we know. But there's, a, there's so much more we don't. You know, that's the best answer I can give. Yes, sir. Has there been the investigation about your affluent uh, emerging with the uh, emerging shellfish farming that's going on? How oh, the uh, California Sea Ranch? Yeah, we are work, we're in constant conversation with the California Sea Ranch folks. They just started their operation, so we don't have that data yet, but we are mindful and they are mindful of that. Uh, probably a year or two from now, I'm going to have really good information for you. But at the moment, no. Uh, no one's done that work because they just started their operation. But using as, as, as nourishment for the ranches. Right. Um, again, how much of that will come into play, it, that, that's a study that remains to, we don't have the, the data on that yet. Uh, I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. And uh, California Sea Ranch is probably gonna look at it. We won't. Uh, we're just gonna be the, the, the uh, uh, fertilizer providers and they'll be the farmers. And, uh, but we are working co cooperatively with them. Yeah, we are. Um, yes? That's why that's that's why we covered them. That's one of the reasons why exactly we covered them. That's also one of the gases that we now burn to create the electricity that I talked about. We're recapturing all of that that we can. Uh, the amount uh, AQMD is one of our regulators. And so we have a discharge, aerial discharge permit from them. We have an active air monitoring program. Unfortunately, I do water. Uh, and so I don't know. All I know is we meet all of our permit requirements. You know, we've never had a violation. But how much of our methane actually gets into the atmosphere, I don't know. But again, I know who does. So give me a call, shoot me an email. I'll get that answer for you. Yes, sir. Do you look at uh, microplastics when you not yet. The nurdles, yeah, not yet. Uh, we have done some work. Uh, I think we've even so collected some samples for Captain Charlie Moore and Algalita Marine. Uh, that's, you know, that's one issue. The other one that we, not just we, but really the industry, and I mean industry period, hasn't really addressed, are things like the microtubules, the carbon microfibers and, and whatnot. Uh, no one knows the toxicity of those yet, and yet they're commonly in use. And that's something that really needs to be looked at. Uh, I don't, we have not looked at it in our program, but that's actually a very interesting question and strategic process studies. So I'll, I'll make a note of that. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Bill. Uh, you said uh, that when you do your rockfish surveys that uh, they're meeting all the contaminant standards very easily. Correct. Are there any fish consumption advisories for any species in Orange County coastal waters like we have for a variety of species here in uh, LA County coastal waters around the PV area? Yes, yeah, specifically ours is California Corbina, which is really not part of our monitoring program because it's right off the surf zone. And those are the people that are fishing off the beach that are going to catch those. Uh, White Croker, I believe now in, in Orange County, as well as LA County, has one. Uh, we're looking more at the state and federal uh, standards for PCBs and DDT, the chlorination, you know, chlorinated compounds. Uh, and we're well below the federal standard consumption standards for those. But in our monitoring program, we don't get, uh, we rarely get a, a White Croker. And we never get California Corbina. So we're not really testing those species. We're more concerned with the hook and line rockfish, the cattle boats that go out and take everybody out. And, and uh, so no, we don't, don't really have that. Jeff, maybe one Sir. more question. Okay, fair enough. Anybody, one more? <coughs> one more. I want to take that last one. Yes. Um, how do you get your funding? Oh, that's a re really good question. Uh, we are a public agency and we serve 25 cities and areas in Orange County and when our residents pay their water bill, a certain amount of that goes to us. We get a very little bit of revenue from tax dollars from the state, but it's very minimal. And then we have taken our money and invested it, and we have investments that we draw from that also allow us to remain in the lower 50% of the nation as far as what we charge per person. I believe it per million gallons, it costs about $1,700 to treat per million gallons. You know, but then there's all the overhead that goes into that. That's the actual treatment cost. 
but then there's the overhead, my program that's required by law, and all the support staff and everything else. But that's where we get our money from. We are governed by, of the 25 uh, region, or cities and, and areas we serve, uh, we have a board of directors, so city councilmen, mayors, uh, one of the members of the board of supervisors, they all are on our board of supervisors, and, or our, our board of directors, and they, they direct our agency and where we head. That's an excellent question. So let's thank Dr. Armstrong for his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A little token uh, thank you for us, so please enjoy that. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff.